and Noel. Um, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, in the lockdown for the last three months, uh, I was able to put 27 presentations together, each take 80 or 100 hours, and this is one of them, uh, the all the story of the uh, Costa Concordia. I'll just show you this so that you, I'll remind you uh, what you probably saw on the front page of the papers when this happened, uh, a ship over on 70 degrees on its side, sitting on rocks. Uh, all right, uh, where did I get the material to do this from? A lot of it came from this book, In Whom We Trust, written by Captain John Dickenberg. That's not Captain Jim John Dickenberg on the cover. That's Edward John Smith, the captain of the Titanic and the photo of the Titanic. But <clears throat> John Dickenberg uh, has got an extensive Navy experience, ships and submarines and uh, is currently the captain of the Endeavour and captain of the James Craig. So he's gone from uh, really fast ships uh, to slow sailing ships. And what he took was a hundred years and focused on 14 sea disasters during that period, from the Titanic to the Costa Cordia, which is exactly a hundred years, but not just what happened with the ships. What did the cap, how did the captains handle this situation? What were their tactics and decisions? And of course, some, uh, saw it as the opportunity to excel and take charge, and others uh, went into shock. Uh, so it's not just about the ships, it's really about Captain uh, Francesco Chitino, who was the captain of the Costa Concordia. All right, we're going to have a look at the ship, the captain, the shipping industry at this point in time, the timeline, the overview timeline of what happened. We'll go on the bridge and uh, see what happened there. Uh, the rescue, the chain of events that led to this, there's never a single thing that uh, creates a disaster. There's always a series of uh, things. And the changes that resulted, whenever you have an accident like this, there's going to be changes. What the report uh, found, the recommendations after that. The most interesting thing of this to me, being a the old engineer, is the salvage and then the scrapping. And uh, like everyone uh, that is... Uh, uh, tried for things and gets a sentence. Uh, there are people that go, that, uh, that wasn't fair. Uh, all right, so uh, the Costa line is owned by Carnival. Carnival o owns almost half of all of the cruise ships that are running around the world today. So here's the Costa company's uh, safety record. Uh, you'll see in 2008, uh, the Costa Concordia crashed into a dock. Uh, and then right through to 2012, the Costa Concordia accident, which we're going to do in some detail. So they've had a few incidents, uh, collisions with ships, uh, catching fire, etc., uh, during this time. All right, well, let's have a look at the ship. I mentioned owned by Carnival. It cost in uh, Australian dollars 900 million. Remember that number. And it gets uh, in service 2006. It's, remember, 100,000 tonnes, 3,000 passengers. It's three football lengths long, and it needs 8.2 metres. The Symphony of Seas, by the way, which is one of the huge liners today, just notice twice the tonnage and twice the number of passengers. But in its day, it was the flagship for the Carnival, uh, and it was one of the largest ships of its day. It just shows you how cruise ships have uh, grown over the years. Here's a photo of it. Another photo at sea, beautiful looking uh, ship. When you see the interior, if you want to Google stuff, uh, it really was a magnificent uh, ship. All right, this is what they're about to do. They're about to leave Rome uh, on a seven day cruise. You'll notice the red star there, they didn't get too far. Uh, they only uh, got uh, two, uh, three hours uh, away from Rome. All right, if I ask you uh, what ships uh, are emblazoned in your mind? What's the name of ships? Of course, you'll uh, remember this name, Titanic. Here's a model of the Titanic against the Costa Cordia. Uh, the Costa Cordia, Concordia is much larger. And here's one that's also emblazoned in your mind. It's called the Ruby Princess. All right, why is it called Concordia? It's all about peace between European uh, nations, and we'll see they named the decks uh, to really make this come to life. It's uh, completed in 2005, uh, but the standards are 50 years old by which it's built. The reason for that is quite simple. Technology is changing so fast. By the time they decide on a standard, try to get it approved, it's obsolete. So, uh, but however, they did get some new ones in place in 2010. 
can do 20 knots. It's got diesel engines and electric motors driving the propellers. It has shafts and propellers. It doesn't have the modern uh, ASI pods, uh, the rotating propellers. And uh, it's got 3,000 passengers. So there's 4,000 odd people who are all up here. And it's got 13 uh, public decks. In other words, 13 decks. And 13th of January uh, was when uh, this accident happened. All right, now here's a quick lesson uh, in Italian. Uh, you can see the Italian names, the Italian ship. Uh, it, the decks are named after the various countries. The one I like is Austria, I can remember that. And uh, so that's the 13 decks. And there's a bulkhead deck below those 13 decks. The deck, the 13 decks above, of course, have no structural strength at all. It's all aluminium and glass. The only real uh, structural strength is in the hull of the ship. And there's three decks below, uh, just like the Titanic, uh, 16 watertight compartments, two for the engines, one for the electric motors driving the propellers, and all of the electrical switchboards and all of the control of electricity is down there as well, as well as the pumps. Uh, if it ships in water, uh, the damage control, uh, everything down, is down in these compartments. If it uh, is hulled and two compartments are flooded, all okay. Uh, it can still stay afloat and keep going. All right, the captain, Francesco, 52 years old. Now here's an interesting bit of information. His mother was the ship owner's daughter. Uh, he'd sailed with uh, tankers and uh, large ferries, but no cruise ships. So he starts his uh, uh, captain's cruise ship in 2006, married with a family. The Costa president, when he interviewed him for the job, uh, some of the notes uh, that were written as a result of the interview had two words that would never been explained, character issues. What did he see? Uh, during the uh, hearing, uh, the inquiry, uh, his fellow officers described him as arrogant, too exuberant, braggart, inflexible authority, the really old fashioned captain. I'm in charge here, just do as I say. I don't want to hear what you think. Not exactly a team player. All right, here's an, over, an overall timeline. So you've got some idea of the overall time. It uh, hits a rock. Uh, the next day, Yoshitino uh, is detained. The passengers very quickly get something like $13,000 for the loss of their belongings and uh, no uh, crews. And this is a very uh, important uh, maritime environment here which brings tourists uh, and dives to the island. Uh, so it's very important uh, and it's of course damage. So it's fined a million euros. Notice a year later, the trial of all involved. Uh, we'll see who got tried. Uh, they really got a slap on the wrist, uh, most of them apart from Chitino. And sorry, we'll go back and uh, look at this. Three years later, uh, finally, after a lot of protests, he's found guilty and get 16 years in prison. All right, here is Francesco Chitino. All right, now, the shipping industry at this point in time, uh, uh, cruising is a, something, an activity that lots of people do. It's grown very quickly. The technology, the electronics on the bridge, uh, the, how it drives itself, everything uh, is developed uh, very quickly. And of course, with all these new ships coming online, where do you get the experienced captains and the experienced officers? So everyone's in a bit of a learning curve and often they are on a ship with technology that they've never really been trained in. And their attitude is, well, we just, uh, technology uh, is what we uh, really uh, believe in. And uh, not like uh, the older style captains that would go, all right, this is new technology. Let me uh, really think about whether this is uh, telling me the truth or I uh, need to think of it again. The regulations, of course, cannot catch up uh, with uh, this. And uh, you can go to sea for a day without anyone knowing where their muster stations or lifeboats, uh, uh, where their particular lifeboat is. And of course, this happened three hours after they left. So the people on board have got no idea uh, what to do in an emergency. And uh, how would you like the, uh, most of these ships are registered in funny places. Uh, which means they can be built to uh, less standards, safety requirements are less, taxation advantages, uh, but they can employ a crew uh, with very little training and very little pay. And of course, uh, you've got, uh, we found out on Ruby Princess where, they, where the crew came from, the Philippines, Indonesia, 
And in, on this ship, there's 40 nationalities. So in an emergency, communicating and getting those people uh, to do what they need to do is going to be a real challenge. All right, seven o'clock it leaves Rome. Only uh, nearly three hours later, it hits the rock. It loses power and it's just, uh, its momentum takes it a bit further. We'll see diagrams of all this. The breeze turns it round and it comes back onto the shore and uh, grounds on the rocks and then uh, capsizes. It's noticed the abandoned ship uh, is given nearly three hours, uh, sorry, three hours after, two, hour, two to three hours after it. And the rescue uh, takes uh, another four hours in total six hours to get the 4,000 people off. However, there's 32 passengers unaccounted for and 30 bodies are eventually uh, found. Uh, the other two bodies were found during the uh, uh, scrapping. All right, on the bridge. Well, that's what a uh, bridge of a modern cruise ship looks like. Computer screens everywhere. And uh, here's another shot of a bridge. Note to somebody with binoculars. Uh, by the way, you may recall uh, two or three years ago, two US Navy ships within months of each other had collisions with other ships. A number of sailors were killed. Uh, when they did the inquiry into this, all of the training was about looking at computer screens. And the, the final uh, uh, conclusion from the inquiry, if these guys would have looked out the window, the, the collisions wouldn't have happened. All right, uh, so what have we got up on the bridge? Obviously the steering, uh, uh, the ability to steer it, the engine, thruster controls, compasses and charts, a computer navigation system, radar, a fathometer, which tells us uh, how much water we've got uh, under the keel, and AIS. I, an AIS screen is one that, uh, just like a, a uh, screen for a traffic, air traffic controller, it shows all of the ships around you, the type of ship they are, uh, their course uh, and their speed, uh, everything you need to know to figure out whether they're a danger to you or not. All right. Uh, now, Francesco decides, uh, calls the uh, navigator over and says, look, tonight we're going to do a course deviation. We're going to deviate from the normal course and we're going to go close uh, to the island, uh, as, to the island. Uh, there's no communication of the change to anyone else. Only the navigator and the uh, captain know about this. And he describes it as touristic navigation, but it isn't. Uh, this is something that cruise ships occasionally do go close to shore just to uh, entertain the people on shore and the people on the ship. Uh, this is his salute. The captain that was his mentor has uh, retired on the island and he's going to go close to the island, call uh, Captain Mario Palambo on his mobile, blow the uh, horn on the ship a few times and uh, that's his way uh, of saluting uh, uh, his previous mentor. They use, a, uh, the navigator uses a small scale chart. Uh, there is a larger scale available and the course is entered into the computer system. There's no briefing uh, of any other officers as to what's going here. Chutino uh, <clears throat> then goes uh, to dinner and uh, he comes back on the bridge uh, after dinner with the maitre d' and a woman uh, on, joins uh, them on the bridge. And he gets on the phone, tells him uh, we're on approach, and now takes uh, control of the ship from the first officer. So here's a, an, an overview of uh, what happened. Here's the normal course here. And you can see up here, uh, if I can get my pointer up there, on the top right hand of the screen, you'll see it's a major deviation. The ship normally is eight kilometers uh, off the island of Giglio. And the main, the main uh, screen in front of you here shows down the bottom the collision with the rock. They lose all power, uh, the engine rooms are flooded, and then on its own momentum, it goes up until the breeze turns it round and it comes back and grounds on the rocks uh, there. All right, here's the uh, lady that uh, came up on the bridge uh, with him. She's a Moldovan uh, dancer, age uh, 26. Under intensive questioning, uh, she finally uh, told the truth. One of the uh, last questions she was asked is, yes, uh, we don't have any record of you being allocated a cabin. Where were you going to sleep tonight? And if you don't answer this correctly, you'll go to jail. Uh, she then admitted that she was Chitino's uh, lover. All right, on the bridge. 
he decides, well, uh, I'd like to go closer, cuts the distance in half from the shore, which was already close. Everyone else is just standing there. All the other officers are going, all right, this is your ship. You, you're showing it off. Uh, you, you do it. Uh, he then uh, takes uh, the computer uh, system out. It would have it would have had alarms to tell him uh, if it's way off the course, uh, and uh, he takes the helm to manual control. He's by the way he's left his glasses in the dining room where he had dinner, uh, so he's asking the officers occasionally to tell him what the radar, what what's on the radar, etc. Uh, just to uh, really make it look good, he uh, turns uh, up to 16 knots. He's doing this visually now, and he turns to starboard. He's approaching the island, so he needs to turn to starboard to go uh, off the coast of the island. And uh, all of a sudden, he see, sights broken water uh, uh, off the uh, port bow. He knows uh, that shallow water. And uh, then uh, he instructs the helmsman uh, to turn the helmsman is, by the way, is an Indonesian uh, who doesn't really understand English. The official language is Italian. Uh, uh, so he's instructed a hard turn to starboard. Uh, and of course, those of you uh, that sail or, or race a yacht, uh, I had this happen in the last uh, race before everything closed down. We just couldn't make a mark. It was supposed we were supposed to round it to port and the breeze just wouldn't let us get there. Uh, so we're aiming straight at the mark and of course uh, you can uh, shoot this mark so you come up within a couple of meters of it the helmsman puts it over hard to starboard then as the mark comes alongside midships the timing is critical here you go hard to port and if you've timed it well and you've got enough uh, speed uh, you can get round an obstacle so this is of course uh, what Chichino uh, plans to do he screams at the helmsman uh, hard hard turn to port uh, and uh, the helmsman just uh, stops, looks at him and says, make up your bloody mind or something like that. So it's uh, the timing uh, is gone. Uh, the ship then uh, hits the rock, then hits the port stern. All right. Uh, so uh, the first action is to close the water type doors. The three key compartments start to flood. Remember, uh, two was okay. Uh, uh, the engineer and crew are probably having a quite uh, rest down there, thinking they're all at sea, completely unprepared for anything like this. Uh, they lose the uh, lose the, the uh, with the uh, uh, diesels gone. They've got no power. Uh, the switchboard. They're trying to do all sorts of things to uh, give it power. Uh, but the emergency power comes on for 41 seconds before they're flooded, the gener emergency generators. Of course, now communication throughout the ship is reduced and they finish up on emergency battery power, which isn't going to last uh, for too long. All right, so uh, the ship now with a hull, uh, there's a, something like a 50 meter gash, just like the Titanic down the side. Uh, we'll see uh, photos of all this. It starts to list to port and Chitino goes into absolute shock. Uh, he's completely lying about the situation. He's uh, telling everyone uh, that uh, all the people, on, not the passengers, but he's saying, look, we've just got an electrical problem. We'll have this sorted in no time. And uh, he really, uh, what he's seeing is uh, he's not just not telling the truth uh, and what's going on. So three compartments are flooded now, two more flood the ship will definitely sink. Now notice this is only 10 minutes after, the correct procedure here would be to issue a mayday. A mayday, unfortunately in Marine Rescue, I was involved in a couple of maydays. When you hear a mayday, uh, the voice is a little bit shaky normally, uh, but what you need to tell them is your position. That's pretty easy. You're east of the island of Giglio and you, you can be found very quickly. The number of people on board, the problem, and how long uh, before you think you're in uh, you will sink. If he had done that at this point in time, red buttons uh, would have been pressed everywhere uh, and lots of uh, the rescue uh, services would be uh, in action. So we're still talking about telling people uh, under an electrical problem and worst of all, they're told to go back to their cabins to retrieve their life, belt, uh, life uh, vests. And the officers are standing there while all this is going on and they choose uh, not to intervene and uh, stop uh, this uh, ridiculous uh, communication going on. 
And however, some of the passengers go, oh, look, we think there's something uh, going on here. They start to don life jackets. Uh, so at 12 minutes, uh, Shatino decides to call the crisis uh, centre. Uh, he, we hit something. He doesn't tell them he's sinking. And uh, it's just uh, denial of what's happening. And uh, they, of course, think, well, all right, if you hit something, you should drop the anchors and assess the damage. They have no idea uh, of the uh, crisis on the ship. So then Marine Rescue gets involved. Life jackets are now issued. The water starts invading the passenger spaces. The ship stops moving and it gets uh, taken back by the breeze uh, and uh, towards Giglio Port. And uh, interesting in the inquiry, uh, Oshitino claims this is brilliant seamanship that he could actually bring the ship back because uh, if it went out into deep water, it certainly would have sunk with, a, with a, probably a quite different result. So now the ship's listing to starboard. Uh, when you look at the size of this ship, uh, a good breeze will list it. Normally, uh, in, in normal circumstances, you could ballast, move fuel, uh, water ballast, etc., to keep it uh, perfectly level. But now with no power, you can't do anything. So the breeze is going to push it over. They request a tug. There's no tug anywhere near them. And then uh, finally start distress message. But notice this is 45 minutes later now and they issue a general alarm. A general alarm is just to get people to go uh, to stations. People don't know where uh, their station is. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> the passengers uh, try to fly, uh, do it, uh, but they just go to the nearest lifeboat. It's absolutely chaos on board. The anchors dropped, but they don't hold. Uh, there's no movement of the ship to do that. And then finally, uh, a long time later, the abandoned ship is given, which is the order to uh, drop the, to people to board the lifeboats. Uh, now the ship grounds. It's now able to pivot on the rocks that it's touching. And of course, once it's listing, the center of gravity is over that pivot point and it's going to start capsizing and it's going to do it quite quickly. So uh, Shatino uh, takes no further action. It, uh, start, it's goes to 60, it eventually goes to 70. And the deck, of course, is quite steep. So miraculously, Shatino uh, slips down the deck and uh, into a lifeboat. That's what he claims. Uh, the video shows him uh, deliberately uh, boarding a lifeboat. All right, uh, the passengers are now left to, to absolutely fend for themselves. When he leaves the the uh, boat, the ship, uh, there's still hundreds of passengers on board. Uh, Italian law, uh, and I'm not sure whether it's a general law. You, I know there's a tradition everyone knows that a captain goes down with the ship. Uh, that's not the case. The law says that the captain must be the last person to leave. He must have done everything possible to get uh, people to safety before he can leave. So he's in big trouble. And uh, you can imagine uh, now it's starting to, to list the starboard boats. Uh, the st it's listing to starboard. So they're swinging out from the ship and it's difficult for people to get on. And of course, the port ones are stuck against the ship and they're difficult to, to lower. But they do eventually get them down. And of course, with a 70 degree list, you just cannot cross uh, the deck uh, and water keeps coming in. The Coast Guard uh, get alerted. Passengers are on their mobile phones. Uh, calling uh, people on Giglio Island uh, saying, and uh, now everything happens. Uh, rescue boats uh, uh, come in, helicopters scramble, and some try to swim to shore. Unfortunately, uh, the dive off the ship is a high dive, and uh, uh, a lot of them die in the attempt, uh, and some can't swim the distance. So uh, a lifeboat comes ashore, and uh, Captain Chitino is in it. And uh, the Coast Guard order him back to the ship. You may have heard at this time, there are video clips uh, produced uh, of it. Uh, he uses some fairly rough language to tell him to get back to the ship, uh, but Chitino goes home. All right, here's what caused the problem. You can see the huge gash, uh, and that's a 70 ton uh, rock uh, stuck in the side of the ship. That thing to the right of the rock is a rope ladder. It's what a pilot uses to board and uh, leave the ship. Uh, and it, a rope ladder is a rope ladder. It's not like an ordinary ladder. So it's flat against the hull. All right, interesting. Uh, the stabilizer didn't get caught on the rock. Uh, 
and uh, this is what the people on the island, when they woke up in the morning, what they saw. Another shot uh, from further away. Uh, all right, to give you some idea, the ship is sitting on two rock pinnacles. If you look to the right of the screen and the left of the screen, you'll see the, to the right is the bow section, to the left is the stern. You can see the massive damage in two parts there. The ship has ground itself onto two rock pinnacles, which is uh, going to be uh, hard to do anything with. All right, uh, close up of the rock, uh, there's bits of the steel on the uh, seafloor here. It, it tore a lot of it straight off the ship. And uh, that rope ladder, if you can just imagine yourself after the experience you've been through coming down that ladder, you've almost got nothing to grip. It's flat against the hull. And at the bottom, of course, you, you've probably got the marine growth uh, there. Any one person that slips here is going to take a whole lot of people with them. Uh, it would have been a, a really dangerous, difficult thing to do for a lot of the passengers. All right, a lot of them uh, were airlifted off. All right, so why did it uh, capsize to starboard? It was the port side that the rock uh, uh, tore apart and flooded, uh, and it starts to lift the ship. Uh, the rudder is locked to starboard. Uh, there's no power to, uh, to do anything with it. And uh, these ships are built so that there is a cross flooding system. Once the uh, compartments fill on the port side, it's going to cross flood. Uh, and in that case, the ship uh, will come somewhat upright. Uh, but the breeze, as I mentioned, turns it round and causes it to list to starboard. And then uh, it grounds. All right. Uh, why did all this happen? The small scale charts, a large scale chart would have clearly highlighted uh, the rocks. Uh, well, not the use, the fact that it was turned off. So all the alarms that uh, uh, could have alerted people something wasn't quite right. Uh, the Shitino turned off that, uh, went to manual control. Uh, just uh, the officers just weren't prepared for anything. They didn't know what was happening. And of course, the communication with the helmsman, the helmsman just uh, stuck there, uh, you know, and left uh, the rudder at starboard instead of turning to port. And uh, the design of the ship itself, uh, the center of where the center of gravity is. Uh, and of course, uh, nobody takes command uh, questions. Or nobody just takes over uh, when Shitino is in uh, shock and just can't comprehend the situation uh, accurately and uh, the lack of training for the crew. They didn't know how to use the lifeboats. Uh, and of course, uh, with the uh, many nationalities communication with the crew. I guess by the, this time, you're all thinking about which cruise you'd like to go on next year. All right, what happened next? Well, now uh, you people before they uh, depart from the wharf, uh, they go to their muster stations and they know which lifeboat uh, they're going to board in the case of a of an emergency. There's uh, no longer a single uh, couple of people on the bridge uh, planning something different. Uh, it's all done now as a team. Of course, the access to the bridge is limited. Uh, no more ladies, uh, girlfriends on the bridge. And uh, additional life back jackets. You don't have to go back to your uh, cabin to get it. They're going to be uh, stowed all around the ship. And the nationality of the passengers, not only the communication with the crew in an emergency, they had no idea how many nationalities on board and how many languages uh, to do the communication in and uh, some standard emergency instructions. Now we are, uh, get, there's lifeboat practice for the uh, crew. Uh, once more teamwork on the bridge and uh, once more, more life jackets spread around the ship uh, so they don't have to uh, go down to their cabin. All right, so uh, the report findings from the inquiry. Surprise, surprise, scathing of bridge management. The engineering crew did everything they possibly could. Uh, nobody was really monitoring the ship's uh, position and uh, chaotic approach to the crisis. Procedures not followed. The May Day should have been issued as soon as they uh, knew they were sinking. And lack of technical knowledge, uh, Shitino and the officers really didn't understand the technical uh, nature of the, the ship. And of course, uh, there was no organization. Normally you would have a damage control team to assess this and do uh, something with it. 
And the final conclusion was, uh, which will be of no surprise, failed in most aspects of duty. All right, the trial. Five people found guilty. Manslaughter, negligence and wrecking. The crisis director, he should have asked more questions uh, and actually uh, done something to help when he was called. Uh, the cabin service director is responsible uh, uh, for the uh, crew uh, and their uh, training. First officer, helmsman, of course. Uh, the, uh, the helmsman uh, was supposed to appear in court, uh, uh, but he returned to his village in Indonesia and couldn't be found. Uh, the third officer, and uh, they uh, did plea bar bargaining, pleading guilty, and even although they were given two years, uh, they didn't go to jail. All right, once now bridge management training, uh, <clears throat> This is the uh, what comes out uh, now. Nearly all of these ships have double bottoms. Uh, so in case you scrape something, uh, if you damage the outside hull, you're still okay. Uh, now they're saying, hey, you need a double hull up the sides. More redundancy. Uh, uh, the switchboards on the higher deck, another emergency generator. The uh, how the lifeboats are launched. Uh, I think uh, the ones that were being launched were only capable in a 15 degree list. They're trying to uh, design lifeboats, uh, which with a greater list than that will work uh, easily. And here is the real uh, interesting part of the story. You may have found that interesting, but this bit I think is even more interesting. March, uh, remember it happened in January, the fuels uh, removed. Now there are thousands of tons of fuel uh, uh, lubricating oil and everything, it's a significant amount. And uh, once the divers go down and see that it's resting on the two pinnacles and all of the damage, it's written off. Uh, it's uh, now declared a total loss, loss by the insurance companies. And in 2013, it comes up to the vertical and uh, the cost at this stage is, remember it cost 900 million the insurance excess alone is 30 million. Uh, how would you like to have that on your boat? And uh, July, a year low, or over a year later, uh, it's the start of the refloat. The costs now one and a half billion. And then finally, the final cost after the scrapping is two billion for a ship that cost 900 million to build. All right, the salvage. As I mentioned, it's a special protected marine area. It's critical to the island as tourists. Uh, uh, dive uh, and just uh, because of this there are things called uh, giant fan fan muscles uh, and the 200 of those are removed by hand to a safe location there you can see the amount of heavy fuel oil now you just can't take things like this off a ship you're going to disturb uh, how the ship is, is sitting so they have to meticulously uh, add two valves to every tank one to suck the oil out and the other one to let the water in so that the oil is replaced by water so that the weight doesn't change uh, that much. And of course, uh, this takes years and there's uh, winter storms and the ship uh, with the huge crashing against it is slowly uh, collapsing under its own weight. Uh, the, it, no ship was ever meant to be on its side and uh, holding its own weight that way. And uh, they can't, they, the divers that go in to try to look at inside, it's an absolute mess. Everything is floating, they can't get through a lot of it. Uh, and of course you can imagine uh, uh, the rotting uh, furniture, in particular the rotting food. It's carrying tons and tons of uh, food uh, and all, a lot of this uh, is inside. Uh, they also uh, blow holes in the hull to try to get in to retrieve the bodies. All right. Now you're wondering what a fan muscle is. Uh, that's uh, what was uh, taken to a safe place, a very rare uh, a marine uh, life. All right, now, the normal method of cutting something like this up, there have been uh, car carriers in this situation. Uh, what you do is you put a barge either side and you have a, uh, a steel cable impregnated with diamonds on the, and this is just drawn back and forth against the ship. It's just a giant hacksaw. It cuts the ship up into pieces. A huge crane uh, lifts them onto a barge. And that's the normal way that ships are salvaged. However, you can't do this on a passenger ship of this size. As soon as you start cutting into pieces, 
stuff is going to fall out and uh, I'll leave you imagine what's going to fall out apart from all the passengers uh, uh, stuff and the debris is ju you just can't contain it the mess is going to be awful so you can't uh, cut it into pieces as I mentioned and there's uh, just too much uh, in particular poisonous debris so uh, they struggle uh, to think about well how are we going to do this it's uh, got to come up in one piece. How do you possibly uh, bring something 100,000 plus tons, three football fields long, upright uh, and get it out of there? And they go back to Pearl Harbor. Well, the battleships that took multiple torpedoes and bombs uh, all uh, turned on their side or turned upside down in Pearl Harbor. And they were recovered, remarkably recovered. So it's called power buckling. Power buckling is centuries old. It's called you use ropes and you can rotate something up a, a slope or you can use that sort of simple principle and you could get a mechanical advantage uh, depending on how many ropes uh, and how you do it. So here's the Oklahoma, nearly completely upside down after the attack. It's taken something like six torpedoes and a couple of bombs. Uh, I won't go through the loss of life on board. As you can imagine, it was horrific. And here's how they're bringing it upright. Just have a look at the number of pulleys and number of cables. All those, that structure that you can see uh, in the background there has been built onto the hull of the ship. That is going to be pulled and bring the ship upright from uh, being overturned. Uh, there's a mechanical advantage here of 17, given all those pulleys and cables. So if that winch in front there can pull 100 tonnes, it can now pull 1,700 tonnes, and there's 22 of uh, these uh, going into action. Here we are, the ship's uh, starting to come up. Here it is at 90 degrees, and here it is completely upright. It is, however, still sunk, sitting on the, the bottom. Uh, here it is uh, in a dry dock. It was assessed due to all the torpedo damage uh, as unsalvageable and uh, was eventually scrapped, but they did bring it upright. So uh, now the uh, salvage company for the Costa Concordia says, well, we'll do this. All right, so this is how it's done. The boat, as I mentioned, the ship, as I mentioned, is uh, in big storms are moving. So the first thing is to anchor it in place. Chains uh, that hold, stop it from going any further. Then there's a steel platform uh, built the steel platform built. Now remember, the just think of the magnitude of this. These platforms weigh hundreds of tons of steel. And of course, they've got to be perfectly aligned with the hull. So when it rolls, if they're out of line, uh, this ship is similar to sitting in a dry dock where you put keel blocks underneath it, which have to match the under uh, the shape of the keel of the boat. So these all have to be lined up perfectly so that the ship can roll on it and not further damage uh, the hull. Now, there's more rock here that it can touch. So 2,000 grout bags, literally a mattress here is uh, laid to cushion that so it doesn't touch the rocks, not damaged by the rocks as it comes onto there. And uh, 15 huge chaosons or sponsons. Each of these are 11 stories high, by the way. Uh, so they're welded. They have to be welded to the hull. You can't do anything with the... Uh, uh, the structure up here, it has no strength, so you all ha have to do it with the hull. And then eventually you start pulling the ship up uh, using power buckling. We'll see a couple more diagrams with huge cables. Once, of course, the ship uh, starts coming up, you can start to put water in these sponsons and the weight of the water is going to reduce the effort of the cables. So the next step is it's now sitting on the cradle and you've got the... Uh, the sponsons here full of water. The next job is to pump the water out of the sponsons and float the ship. So that's the procedure uh, to salvage the Costa Concordia. All right, here it is. And you can see the size uh, of the sponsons and the material. Uh, these are the huge jacks here uh, that are going to pull the cables. Uh, another shot here. They have to go something like nine meters into the rock, six foot wide. This, it's not to scale. This structure here is absolutely mammoth. And the jacks, the hydraulic jacks, are called uh, strand jacks. 
and here's the uh, mattress uh, that is going to protect it from further damage uh, on the rock. So this is enormous uh, engineering uh, uh, procedure. Here you can see all of the cables uh, uh, that have now gone over and it's those cables that are going to uh, pull the ship upright. Another shot with all of the cables. And uh, what they find is they start to bring it up. The bow section is 200 feet of it is unsupported. So they have to go and build uh, these blister tanks. One's on the other side to support the bow because if the bow uh, snaps off, uh, they're in big trouble. All right, here it is. Uh, it's sitting on the, on the, cr the steel uh, cradle. Uh, <clears throat> and now the sponsons are welded uh, attached to the starboard side, the seriously damaged starboard side. And now uh, the sponsons are, the water's pumped out of them. Now the, the ship uh, rises uh, and it's afloat. Very carefully uh, pulled out of the cradles. The tow, uh, we're now going to tow it to Genoa, which is only a couple hundred miles away, uh, north of the island. Uh, it takes four days. They can only tow it at two knots. Uh, if you look at uh, the shape of things there, apart from that, if you tow it any faster, it's going to cause enormous uh, stresses on everything. And there's 14 ships around it. Uh, a lot of them are tugs, uh, uh, but there's other fire uh, vessels. Uh, anything can happen here. They may need to re-weld stuff uh, if it breaks and it is moored at a seawall. Uh, here it is being towed. If you think that little tug there is uh, pulling this giant thing, not so. If you look carefully out the side here, you'll see cables uh, going out. There are some uh, really uh, big tugs at work here uh, towing this uh, mare, towing this, uh, I mean, it's a huge uh, construction uh, now. Uh, what they do with the 70 ton rock, they put a plaque on it with the 32 names of the uh, the people that uh, didn't survive and uh, put it down to the site. The scrapping. We're three years out now. Uh, it's moved to a dock and of course they start removing all of the upper decks first. Uh, then they remove the sponsons and then the what's left is just the hull. It goes to a dry dock so they can finally uh, recover all of the steel. Uh, and that's completed in July 17. Now that's five years after 2012 when it happened. And uh, it's a bit of a mystery uh, a ship to its end. Uh, all right, here it is up against the dock. Uh, you can see there's still a sponsor attached here and you can see they're starting to do deck by deck. Uh, this is what it looks like. They're just cutting it all up and you can see a crane here uh, taking all the material uh, away. Then uh, the sponsons have come off. These are huge structures weighing hundreds of tons of uh, steel. And here it is in the dry dock. Now what happens here, it gets down to the last sort of bit of steel in the hull if you like, and the poisonous and hazardous nature here of all the stuff that settled Remember, this has been, water's been in this for four years. Uh, so you can imagine the corrosion, the, uh, the, what's happened to everything. And I think the uh, company that's uh, got the scrapping contract decides the cost of working in this hazardous, poisonous environment uh, is more than the uh, value of the steel. So it's in this dock, everything's working. The next morning, everyone turns up and it's gone. It's been towed out to sea and sunk. So uh, the epilogue, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in situations like this, we've had some very important people in this country uh, uh, found guilty or uh, charged with something. And uh, there's always people who say it's unfair or the sentence is, in this case, the sentence is excessive. So uh, they uh, get all sorts of uh, courts to appeal uh, the 16 year sentence. And they claim well, at the court that uh, gave it to him, uh, didn't have any maritime experience. And uh, why should all the other guys get off scot-free almost? Uh, uh, and this, uh, and Captain Chino get 16 years. And they raise a whole lot of uh, issues, the order of hard to port in English, uh, etc. cetera. And uh, the salutes uh, was nothing unusual. Salutes had previously been carried out, but they had been carried out in daytime. All right. 
issue uh, should have taken into account the crew. Uh, they claim 46 uh, and uh, they didn't understand Italian, which is the official language. High center of gravity, the design of the ship itself uh, contributed to this. Uh, notice three of the 69 life rafts launched. They didn't uh, know how to do it. And uh, the evacuation guidelines are 60 to 80 minutes. Uh, that's, you should be able to evacuate a large ship like this in that time. And uh, the, it, it should have had systems that could remain operating for three hours despite uh, serious damage. Uh, and uh, stay on the ship as your own lifeboat until you can get the lifeboats down. All right, uh, so they claim, well, there's nothing unusual here. Shatino suffered, suffered shock. Of course he suffered shock. He saw his career disappear uh, before his eyes and uh, probably his marriage as well. Uh, so once they uh, also recommend uh, double-sided, 16 years excessive, the mafia people who kill people get less than that in Italy. And uh, look, they rail all sorts of things. The interesting thing is one of the first uh, situations of trial by social media in the press. The press headlines in a lot of the Italian papers were Captain Coward. Uh, so uh, his image uh, was certainly influenced uh, by the press and social media. And here's a couple of things that are worth thinking about. There's a huge change in the relationship between the company and the captain. I mentioned before flags of convenience uh, uh, and uh, third parties involved in here. A lot of uh, things are subcontracted out, uh, not owned or, or managed by the company. And of course, if something goes wrong, the officers are the easy targets. But just as you all know about drones and things like that, uh, if you think about MH370, it took some time for people to realize that the Rolls-Royce uh, jet engines on that plane are uh, transmitted via satellite, the operating conditions that they were experiencing uh, every hour to Rolls-Royce headquarters. So uh, there's all sorts of things happen with modern technology and you can have sure placed fleet operation centers who have duplicate uh, uh, duplicate dials and uh, instruments they can see what the what's happening on the ship and in some cases can actually take control of the ship uh, uh, cruise ships by the way have gone off course there's a thing called a gps jammer uh, which you can do uh, of course uh, if they're on autopilot or uh, computer uh, uh, driven uh, it's typically uh, gps is one of the things and uh, you can jam it all right, uh, and of course, uh, once you've got these fleet operation centers and people who know what's going on the ship and the ability uh, to do things to it, you really don't have a captain uh, in charge uh, making all the decisions. Uh, so it's uh, changed dramatically uh, uh, in the last 20 years. All right, that's the story of the Concordia. I hope you found that interesting. Time for questions. Yes. Uh no, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I, um, I'm just um, amazed at the uh, detail that you've gone into and the understanding that you've, you've got of this whole process. Uh, um, it's a seriously um, intricate um, story. Uh, with, with some, you know, it's a reality um, story that uh, you'd almost find it hard to believe that this sort of thing happened. Um, for those that are watching, uh, to, 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 to lodge a question, you just go onto the little uh, chat icon down the bottom, uh, type in uh, your question, and uh, James or myself will pick that up and pass it on to, to Noel. Um, Noel, just while people are thinking about questions, and I'm sure there will be a few coming in, um, I have one. Um, what happened was the ship, as I understand it, hit a rock and pivoted and was caught by the wind and blown back to shore um, where it hit, uh, it, it hit, hit um, some shore, some rocks along the shore and uh, or sank onto those rocks. Had the wind been blowing in a different position, a different angle, a uh, different direction, would the ship have gone out to sea and then sunk completely? Yes, that was, uh, that was the worst possible outcome. It would have been uh, gone out into deep water 
and uh, by that time uh, they would have had great difficulty uh, lowering the lifeboats. So the loss of life would have been much greater if it had been blown off uh, into deep water. So, the, so the, the fact that the wind was, was where it was and the uh, ship was sort of blown um, ashore without any control, with uh, any, any effort um, or direction by the, by the crew um, was probably a godsend. Yes. yes. And, and, and thus the loss of life would have been a hell of a lot more had it, had it gone, gone down out to sea probably. Yes, given the chaos on board, it would have been very difficult to, 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 rescue, to save the, that number of people. It really did. It landed on a rock shelf. We've, we've been there and it, uh, it's, it's about 100 metres, not far off where it landed. Yeah. Um, Noel Lee, did, 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 was there anything in the uh, inquiry that suggested that somebody actually knew the rock was there but, and warned the captain? That he no, was going too close, or was it a no, surprise to everybody? No, apparently, uh, the rock is well charted. It's known rock. It's not an unknown rock. Uh, it's well charted. Uh, I think what happened, the officers uh, just stood back and, you know, you're showing your lady what you can do uh, and just didn't notice. They just, you know, probably chatted to each other. They just stepped out of the, the, the command. Mm, that's pretty scary stuff. Um, they probably just thought that he was completely, he knew, he knew the waters backwards and he knew what he was doing. Yeah. I think the relationship between him and the officers is a key uh, factor here. Yeah. We do have a question, Noel. Uh, the question is, and uh, Neil Easton wants to know, where did they finally sink the hull, the remainder of the hull, do we know? No, uh, nobody will even say what happened to it. It's only... Uh, an assumption that it was taken out to sea and sunk. Nobody will say anything. Uh, uh, the salvage company's probably not going to say anything because it uh, could be liable uh, for not completing, uh, you know, the salvage, the scrapping correctly. So no, I can't find. It's conjecture that that's what's happened. There's no evidence either way. But when you wake up in the morning, and it's gone. It's got to have gone somewhere. Yes. <laughs> And another question uh, from Patricia Haas. Uh, where were all the passengers who died trapped below decks in the like the Titanic? Yes, most of them were uh, trapped uh, below decks. Uh, uh, believe it or not, a lot of them were in lifts. You would think with all of the warnings on lifts, do not use this in a fire or an emergency or anything. A lot of them uh, were in lifts uh, when they lost the power. Of course, if you're in between, you, you know, you're trapped. Uh, so the, the, the passengers themselves, uh, well, they, they were just unaware of what was happening. Uh. Hmm, interesting. Um, Noel, there's a bit, an, another question from um, uh, Keith Sampson. Uh, has any appeal been successful? No, I think uh, the trial by press, etc. here, uh, just made any appeal almost impossible. Uh, they, you know, they just saw him as a complete failure. Okay, uh, Genevieve, um, Genevieve Sartre always wants to um, pursue interesting questions here. Um, uh, um, uh, how is the uh, relationship with the young woman he was trying to impress? <laughs> M mummy's boy. <laughs> I uh, I can't find. I'm unable to find out anything. I'm surprised you didn't have. You haven't done that research, no. I, I, I thought you would get a question like that every presentation. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to get a mobile number. <laughs> see, see if we can get her live for the next presentation. <laughs> uh, Question from Jill Henry is, do we know the strength of the northeast winds which blew the ship back to the shore? 20 knots. Okay. I mean, that's a lot of windage on that ship. Uh, three football fields long, 13 decks high. Uh, we've got 64 people at the moment. That's a great number, isn't it? So, yeah. so we had to be in Italy sort of in 2012 and 2013, and he was on the talk show here he was going in the talk shows protesting his innocence. So he was doing a lot of PR on his own behalf as well. He protected his innocence right to the end. Yeah. 
he, he, did, he was unable to accept responsibility. It was always some other, yeah. some other thing. Mm, mm. Um, now, has anybody got any more questions um, before we wrap it up? I can't see anything more coming through. James, have I missed anything? No, no, all good. Oh, all good, yeah. Um, well, uh, we're just about on time too. Well done, Noel. You've um, timed it beautifully. There's one. Um, were any per personal effects recovered? Uh, to my knowledge, no. The situation down there, as I mentioned, you've got everything floats the mattresses the whole thing uh, the divers uh, there was a team of 32 international top international team and it was so murky and all the stuff that was rotting the, it was just a poisonous atmosphere they could only spend very limited time down there and they had to leave a rope trail so that if the worst thing happened they could you know uh, retrace uh, the, the way they came in they, it was just a nightmare for them Okay, we've had a bit of a um, an assessment here from from um, David Henry. He says it's the wind that uh, saved the lives, uh, and the captain's guilty. Yeah. Doug Sturrock, well done, uh, Dougie. Good to see you here. Um, great presentation. Thank you, Doug and uh, Chris Sturrock. Um, all right. Well, I'm um, going to join uh, Doug Sturrock and and the rest of the. Uh, um, people uh, watching tonight and say, Noel, I think it was a fabulous presentation. Uh, I certainly um, am impressed with, uh, with the way you've um, unfolded the story in, a, in a, a logical way. In fact, so logical, you wondered why you hit the bloody rock in the first place. <laughs> but having done that, it's just a fascinating, it's a fascinating tale. And um, importantly, I hope um, the maritime industry have learnt well from it. I, um, I gather they have. Uh, certainly makes me think twice about going on a ship. And the first thing you want to do is evacuation drill by the look of things. Um, but on behalf of, of all those um, watching tonight, uh, attending tonight, Noel, thank you very much for um, uh, putting on the presentation. Um, we look forward to seeing you at the club um, uh, doing some more live presentations uh, in the future. We hope so. And um, uh, I'd like to just pass across a virtual bottle of wine. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. And um, uh, thank you all for attending. And uh, this will be record, this record is being recorded and will be available on the club website um, in the, well, probably uh, within a day or two, but um, thank you all. And um, Thank you very much, Noel. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Noel. Yes. Thanks for the invitation.